Good evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleespees, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome uh, those of us who are joining us in person uh, and those of us who are joining us online this evening. Uh, for anyone who's coming to the uh, Historical Society for the first time, uh, MHS is the first historical society in America. Uh, we date back to 1791. Um, when we were founded, it was uh, far enough back that when our uh, founder wrote to Paul Revere, Paul Revere wrote back. Uh, so um, we maintain uh, a research library with an amazing collection of material. We hold close to 14 million manuscript pages, uh, including the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents. Um, so we have the papers of John Adams and John Quincy Adams, uh, which is not that surprising, uh, but also the personal papers of Thomas Jefferson. So there are more uh, Jefferson papers in this building than in the entire state of Virginia. Uh, we also host a wide variety of programs. Um, and as the weather is getting warmer, we hope we'll see uh, all of the people coming back to join us in person. We are only able to host programs like these thanks to the support of our members and donors. Uh, we hope that you'll return for future programs, and we hope that if you are not already a member, you'll consider joining uh, or supporting our work. Uh, this evening, we are happy to welcome uh, Catherine Johnston, um, who is joining us all the way from Montana State University. Um, she uh, is an assistant professor there. She is also a former fellow of the MHS. Uh, her research focuses on slavery, race, and the environment in Atlantic plantation societies, uh, and she teaches courses um, in early America and uh, Atlantic history, the history of health, disease, and race, and the intersections of race and the environment. Uh, this evening, she'll be speaking about her book, The Nature of Slavery, uh, which discusses uh, the claims made by 18th century uh, planters in the Caribbean and the American South that only Black people could labor on plantations. They argued that Africans, unlike Europeans, had bodies particularly suited to the to cultivate crops in hot climates. Uh, this, of course, had multiple uh, legacies, including the justif justification of racial slavery uh, and theories of biological race, which took place uh, in the uh, public imagination and among scientists, perpetuating slavery and discrimination. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming our speaker. Uh, well, thank you all so much for being here, and um, thank you, Gavin and Olivia, for making this happen, and uh, it's great to see faces sometimes I haven't seen in 10 years since being a fellow here, so thank you all so much for coming, um, and also thank you. I don't know how to thank like online people for being here, too, but um, all of you. Uh, so... Today, I want to talk a little bit about my book um, and kind of take you through some of my research and how this kind of came to be. So when I started this book, I was a naive graduate school applicant. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, how did contemporary societies, places like the U.S. develop a concept of race, right? And I was like, this is what I'm going to work on. And it, it was actually a really difficult question to ask, um, but it sparked the research for this book. And today I want to talk with you a little bit about that book. Uh, so this is uh, an Atlantic story that I'm going to tell. So I want to kind of um, show you guys a, a little bit, oh, just a couple maps here. Uh, basically, the area that I'm focusing on is mostly the Caribbean, which you can see uh, in this highlighted area, right? And the and the Georgia, Carolina, especially Georgia, low country. Um, this, this is another, just to give you a sense of the area I'm talking about and, um, and this part of Georgia. So I started doing, the research for this book, and I was looking at what what have what have other scholars said about the development of concepts of race, and it all pointed me to the late 18th century, where you know they thought, well, here are these scientists coming out of Europe, and they have these ideas about bodily difference, and this is all connected to, uh, say, 
you know, I mean, I thought this must be connected to plantation slavery, right? I thought, okay, if you're looking at bodies, you're, you're, you're looking at areas where you have say black bodies and white bodies and, and different bodies. And so it, I came across this material that at the end of the 18th century in Britain, in parliament and in the U S in Congress, uh, both of these bodies of these legislatures considered the abolition of the slave trade, right? And so I'm going to get to my point in a second. So they were considering abolishing the slave trade. And in both cases, planters from the U.S. South and from the Caribbean, who were part of this debate in Parliament, insisted that Black people were essential to the maintenance of these plantation societies, right? They said, you cannot abolish the slave trade. We need African workers in these societies because they argued that only black bodies could labor in hot climates and that ending the slave trade, which might be a precursor to abolishing slavery altogether, would devastate these plantation economies. And they argued that white people were physically incapable of labor in these places, but that black people could easily work in the heat. Um, And I just have just one picture uh, of, you know, what these, this kind of societies I'm talking about. Uh, So Landers' claims essentially suggested that they had observed black and white people in hot places, right? And that they observed disparities in their ability to labor when disparities in their health, which led to concepts of race, right? Okay. Some people can work, some people cannot, some people are healthy, some people are not, this leads to race. So I thought, okay, they must've seen white people dying while black people thrived. And this led to their claims. So I went to the archives to look at letters from the colonies and the letters looked like this um, and this and this and this and this and this and this. And then, so uh, the, the point is, right, you, I read a lot of letters and a lot of this research involved deciphering and reading through these letters, looking for evidence of developing concepts of race and difference in bodies. So what I found instead was about health and weather and rain and sickness, right? Of late, we have had more rains than sufficient, which has, I'm sorry to say, been the cause of much sickness. The constant rain has made the parish sickly white as well as black. Many, both white and black people, but especially the latter, uh, were getting sick who are more exposed to the inclemency of the weather, right? And so I found all of these pieces of evidence that was about rain. It was about the weather. It wasn't about what we would think of race. And so the evidence of race and racial difference just wasn't there. So I thought, what's the deal? So I went back and looked more closely at the documents and more materials. And what I found was a history of colonists and planters and slaveholders using a rhetoric of climate to justify and advocate for and demand African slavery in the Americas. So what do I mean by this? I want to talk about this in three parts today. Uh, First, about, I'll talk briefly about the ancient origins of climate theory. Then I'll talk more extensively about the development of this rhetoric to justify slavery. And finally talk about the legacies of this language. So uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about, this is uh, Barbados in the upper left and Antigua in the upper right and Jamaica along the bottom. Um, these are you know British colonies. And okay, I guess you saw the low country map earlier. Um, So I want to start by talking about these ancient climatic theories. And in the 17th century Caribbean, this is like a really brief overview, so I can go into it in more detail if you would like, but you had white people from the British Isles arriving in these places to start plantations. And they bring white laborers with them. And they're doing this work of cutting down trees and starting plantations. And there's indigenous laborers too. And this is happening in the early decades of the 17th century. So early 1600s. And 
during the course of the 17th century, this is something that I could talk much more about, but the, there's this transition to enslaved laborers on plantations, right? There's a transition to mostly growing sugar in these areas and uh, importation of African laborers. These things coincide. There's all kinds of reasons why they coincide. Um, most especially there's these navigation and trade acts between England and Scotland. That means that they can't have free trade. And so a lot of laborers who were coming from Scotland now can't come. And so there's decreasing availability of laborers from the British Isles. Uh, there's also increasing slave traders who are increasingly trading in West Africa. So a lot of this has to do with availability of laborers. People are coming from Africa. They are no longer coming from the British Isles. Uh, this does not mean that planters don't want laborers from the British Isles. And throughout the 17th century, you can find letters of people sort of saying, oh, we need more laborers. We'll pay in advance. We need these people. We need them to come. And they're not coming. They are a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, the other thing I want to mention briefly about the 17th century is this reputation that a hot climate is dangerous to people's bodies and especially to white people's bodies, right? So this kind of goes back to ancient Greek and Roman theories about you can divide the earth into latitudinal zones and you can only live in the temperate regions and the, you know, the poles are too cold and the middle is too hot. And this starts to change with colonialism saying, oh, actually we can go into these hot places, but it's still this lingering thought of like our are white bodies going to survive in these hot places? We don't know, right? And so this is kind of the legacy from these ancient Greek and Roman theories that have enjoyed this revival in the 17th century. Um, but what happens in the Caribbean is two things briefly, kind of major events. So the first is uh, known as the Western design. So 1655, the English try to take Jamaica from the Spanish. Um, it's a somewhat disastrous campaign. Uh, they do sort of eventually manage it. Well, they do manage it, but a lot of people die and people and get sick and they get sick and they die because, you know, some of the wells are poisoned because they don't bring enough food with them. They don't bring enough water with them. They don't have enough supplies. There's all kinds of reasons why they get sick and die, right? For, for all kinds of reasons, but the reputation is sort of growing and solidifying that, ah, oh, yeah, this place is actually not healthy for white people. And the other thing that happens at the end of the 17th century is in 1692, there's this major earthquake in Jamaica, in Port Royal, which is, um, and, and again, the infrastructure sort of falls apart. There's not enough food and water and all these things. And so people are getting sick and dying. And so these two events are pretty well publicized in England and in the, in the British Isles. And so people start to think, oh my goodness, all of these people, all of these white people are getting sick and dying because we've heard about it from the reports of these two events. And so this, the, these places get a pretty poor reputation. Um, but what starts to happen is people who are in Jamaica white people who are in Jamaica who are not getting sick and dying recognize the power of climatic language, right? So they start to use climate as a rhetorical tool. Uh, for example, uh, he, I'm going to show you just a couple of excerpts from letters. So in Barbados, you have, I am persuaded to believe that nothing but my native air can restore me to a perfect state of health again. Okay, this just becomes kind of a thing. People, are, I need to go to my native air. This is how I'll be healthy. John with them. I will never recover my health perfectly in this continual hot and moist air, but must return to my native country. And then you see this development of how people are sort of like, oh yeah, this is the kind of thing that people write all the time. So you have this guy uh, in Jamaica. I desire you to procure his majesty leave for my coming to England, alleging it's for the recovery of my health. For here is no living under such management. So this happens on multiple occasions where people are saying it is supposedly for my health, but really I've got these other reasons for wanting to come back, right? But what you see here is the development of 
the rhetoric of climate. How can I, how can I try to get back? How can I try to get what I'm, where I'm going? Often people will sort of say, oh, I'm so unhealthy here. I really need to come back. And, um, you know, the privy council or something will say, well, how about we just increase your salary? And they're like, oh yeah, that's fine. Right. So (laughs) this is is not necessarily what is going on. Um, So would you begin to see this take shape? And um, so that's kind of the background for what I want to talk about. So I want to talk a bit now about the development of this language. And I'm going to talk about this in two places, first in Georgia in the 1730s and 40s, and then in legislative debates in the 1780s and 90s. So first in Georgia, right? So in 1731, you have a group of trustees in London and they want to establish a new colony of Georgia. Uh, And this is going to be just south of South Carolina. They want it to be different from South Carolina. They don't want it to be this place of really wealthy landowners who are having enslaved people work the land and these plantations. Uh, Instead, they want to have this society of quote unquote worthy yeoman farmers um, that are drawn mostly from unemployed people in Britain. And so the trustees create some rules for the colony. Uh, said no alcohol and no lawyers. This is, <laughs> like these will corrupt this colony. So it, they don't want to have any kind of corruption. Um, but most important for the colonists was a restriction on slaveholding. Uh, so unlike every other British American colony, Georgia was supposed to be a society without enslaved black laborers. They thought the trustees thought that the presence of enslaved laborers would hurt the work ethic of small farmers who would be disinclined to labor. The new arrivals faced problems almost immediately. Uh, The settlers had no experience cutting trees or farming, and you can see that it's fairly surrounded by trees. Uh, And when some of them did clear and plant land, the, they found that insects and vermin like discouraged them. They ate their crops. They said, I've cleared. My neighbor hasn't cleared. They're coming in and they're destroying my crops. Uh, and most discouragingly, these early settler colonists wrote about um, the lack of trustworthy servants. They said, you know, they're running away. Others are robbing us. Uh, some are smuggling rum from South Carolina and spending their time in a constant drunken stupor. Uh, others refuse to work altogether. Um, you had one guy who complained that one of his servants drowned while the other stabbed him with a sword. Um, and although he survived the attack, he lost the servant who died in prison. So people were complaining all the time, right? About they're they're not getting enough good servants. And one group of settlers in particular, historians know them as the malcontents, although at the time the people who wrote about them sometimes called them Grumbletonians, which I really prefer, uh, but we call them malcontents, you know. Um, they start to bombard the trustees in London with complaints about laborers. Servants are too expensive and South Carolinians get enslaved laborers and they're cheaper. And so they're like, we can't, we can't manage um, with having to pay our laborers. So the trustees are unimpressed with these complaints. They don't want to see Georgians get wealthy. Uh, And so, you know, they're like, but, but nobody is going to trade with us. And the trustees are like, meh unimportant, right? You, we want you to sort of do subsistence farming and along the way, you know, start to make some money, but we're, we're not going to change our position. So the malcontents change their tactics and they go from arguing that they can't make any money to saying white people are physically incapable of laboring in Georgia. And actually we need to have enslaved black people. So they wrote that while robust enslaved Africans worked in the sun with pleasure, uh, their frail British bodies dropped dead in the fields, right? The trustees are actually kind of skeptical of these arguments. Um, They actually have evidence of Europeans laboring in Georgia 
from this group of people called the Salzburgers who live 25 miles upriver from Savannah. And you can just sort of see here, the Salzburgers come over from Germany in 1734. They proved to be excellent workers. They produce corn, peas, potatoes, rice, all within the first few years. And their abundant harvests proved to the trustees that industrious workers could indeed produce crops from Georgia's soil from their own labor alone. And the Salzburgers respond to the malcontent complaints, right? They hear about these complaints and they're like, we can work in this climate. Um, their leader says, you know, Georgia is not so very hot as idle and delicate people endeavor to persuade themselves and others. Um, he says, we go out, we work in the morning, and then we take a little break in the midday, and then we go back to work. Not a big deal. So the malcontents start to, you know, increase their malcontent. And they send a petition to the trustees and it's signed by over a hundred inhabitants of Savannah. And they're saying, we need enslaved black laborers because white people can't possibly do this work. As it turned out, several Savannah settlers actually had ulterior motives. Um, they wanted to introduce slavery to the colony for their own personal financial gain, right? So the tactic is there's this settler, this guy, Robert Williams, and he'd begun selling rum and his brother-in-law had abandoned his land and started practicing medicine. And these two had most residents of Savannah in debt to them for medicine and or rum. And so they used this debt to coerce Savannah settlers into signing this petition saying, we can't possibly do this work. Uh, Williams, this guy, he has, he has a brother in St. Kitts and a brother in Bristol. And he's like, I've got these family ties to the slave trade. I want to make Georgia this other node in this trade. And I thought, okay, we'll, we know that these colonists can't really afford to pay for laborers. So we'll take the titles to their land as payment and we will provide them with enslaved laborers and they'll provide us with the titles and then we'll get really wealthy. So to do this, they actually had to persuade the trustees to allow slavery in the colony. Uh, and when the, their economic arguments failed, they started using climatic arguments. The trustees actually don't buy this. They're like, eh, yeah, not so much. But Savannah's population begins to dwindle. Uh, the malcontents decamp for South Carolina, uh, but they're exerting this continuous pressure on Georgia's residents not to grow crops. Uh, as one resident put it, the malcontents discouraged Georgians, quote, from laboring and cultivating their land, lest they should be examples that men can live and support themselves without slaves. So finally, in 1751, Parliament took control of Georgia and allowed African slavery in the colony. But to outsiders who didn't know all of this stuff that was going on, right, the experiment in Georgia appeared to prove that hot climates required black laborers because the malcontents are publishing this and saying stuff about this, like we can't do this and they're making it very public. And so when slavery is allowed, they're like, oh, this must be what happened. So later histories of Georgia written in the 1770s and 80s told the story of the colony's early years in a particular way. Uh, according to these histories, right, the experiment with white laborers failed because they couldn't stand the climate. And although this is not, in fact, what happened, it became the standard narrative of Georgia's history. So when the issue of slavery appeared before Parliament and before Congress, slavery's defenders drew upon this varnish history as proof that white people could not labor in hot climates. So here, I just want to pause and sort of highlight the difference between um, the private letters and the private sources and the public sources, right? So in public, you have the malcontents are actually publishing pamphlets saying this is impossible. And private letters tell this story of Williams and his brother-in-law, Tailfer, and how they're doing this. And so you get these really different stories of what happened if you look at private versus public sources. Uh, but what ended up happening is that the argument that white people were unable to labor in a hot climate perpetuated and justified racial slavery across Atlantic plantation societies. And so Georgia colonists like that 
guy in, in Jamaica manipulated the climatic language to suit their own economic purposes. But from the outside, the story seemed to confirm that this region was too hot for white people to work the land themselves. So the other piece of this development of this language has to do with these, um, these arguments in parliament and Congress, right? So that there's these unequivocal arguments from the Caribbean and from the US South that white people could never labor in a hot climate. Uh, and so I have a, just a couple quotes. Uh, we have in Grenada, you know, the few, few white persons can bear exposition to the intense sun of this climate for a few hours with impunity. And the nature and constitution of a European are not well adapted to retain life in this climate. And the South can only be cultivated by slaves. The climate, the nature of the soil forbid the whites from performing the labor. So in parliament, you get this extended debate over this issue. Um, they start asking questions about, well, what about white people who are born and raised in plantation societies? And the planters are like, it's impossible. And they're like, well, what about free black populations? It's impossible. And they're like, and why do so many enslaved people die? And they're like, oh, it's, it's their own fault, right? And so there's a lot around that too. Um, but again, here you start to get distinctions between public and private. So uh, the, this happens, one example is the plow, the plow. So there's this planter in Jamaica, Simon Taylor, he writes a public letter to parliament. So this is supposed to be shown in parliament. He says, you say a question has been asked about working by Europeans and how it is managed by plowmen. He says, I know of no white plowing man working by themselves. They may indeed for the first day when they go on an estate, hold the plow for half an hour or so to show the enslaved people how to hold it upright. But I never saw a plow going in my life held by a white man an hour. So this is what he wrote to be shared in parliament. In private, he wrote a different letter. It will be necessary for you to send out a good plowman if you can get one that has been used to plow with cattle. The people we want are those that have been bred up heartily in the country on poor meager fare, been used to work hard and get up early. Therefore we prefer Scotch young lads to any others. So this is the same guy writing a letter, a public letter and a private letter. And in public, he says, it's impossible. They can't hold it an hour, right? And in private, he's like, can you please summon someone out, especially someone from Scotland? And he's not going to pay for someone to come all the way from Scotland to work for an hour, right? This is, I mean, this is, so you see this distinction again in these sources and it's, it's a, this this different story, but again, the debates over the slave trade, right? The public stuff is what gets told. And this solidifies a rhetoric of climate and race. And so these threats to the slave trade basically cause planters to draw upon these ancient theories. And they even claim that no white people have ever worked in hot climates. And but as planters from justifying racial slavery insisted that white bodies could never labor in the heat and that only black bodies can cultivate lucrative plantation crops, this notion becomes ingrained in a public consciousness on both sides of the Atlantic and establishes itself as a maxim in the new United States. So I just wanna talk briefly about the legacies of this. So there are short-term legacies and long-term legacies. In the short term, from the earliest sessions of Congress in 1790s through the Civil War in the 1860s, defenders of slavery repeatedly invoked the tenet of climate, labor, and race to uphold racial slavery in the U.S. They insisted that Black bodies could endure hot climates and white bodies could not. And the implication of this was that if each body only suited a particular climate, then those bodies must be different internally. And so during the 19th century, slaveholders, politicians, activists, journalists, and others all utilize this argument when it serves their interest. And 
Those seeking to maintain slave labor on Southern plantations drew upon the climatic argument to warn of economic devastation and collapse of civilization should racial slavery be abolished. According to this narrative, those who supported ending slavery would contribute to the deaths of white people who would be forced to labor in an inhospitable, deadly climate. In this portrayal, racial slavery was essential to the very foundation of the United States, and without it, the nation would fail. So in the U.S., uh, we had the quote earlier that Congressman Smith, he argued that colonial, he argues that colonial Georgia had failed because they didn't have slavery. And especially in the 15 years or so leading up to the Civil War, politicians and newspapers repeatedly asserted that Black people could labor in the South, but that white people could not. So in 1856, an editorial from a newspaper along the Indiana-Kentucky border declared that, quote, the black man is the proper laborer for these hot climes. He flourishes under them while the white man degenerates and dies. And a few years later, a physician addressing a crowd in Macon, Georgia, argued that the history of Georgia proved that no white man can ever stand the burning heat and fatal miasms of the rice fields and of the cotton fields. So the secondly, right, this, this rhetoric is involved in debates over the expansion of slavery in the US. Uh, white politicians used the climatic argument to sanction the extension or rejection of slavery. So as the US expanded, Congress debated which places would have slaves as they became states. Politicians in these cases sometimes represented the rhetoric of climate and slavery as a supposed law of nature. The, quote, great climatic law, as one politician put it, dominated some of the most heated debates over the extension of slavery. So basically, white politicians argued that places with climates conducive to crops usually grown by enslaved laborers, such as cotton, in other words, warm places, would quote, naturally invite slavery, while places with colder climates would naturally discourage or exclude slavery. This logic demonstrates just how deeply white Americans had internalized climatic justifications for racial slavery, along with the implicit assumptions they made about climate, race, and labor, because politicians automatically coupled blackness with labor in warm climates. These sort of longstanding and repeated claims and, and climatic arguments gave rise to the development of a language naturalizing the relationship between race and climate, sanctifying the bonds between slavery and climate as a supposed law of nature. So by presenting this relationship as natural, white politicians made it appear as though the question of slavery was out of their hands, right? It's not something that can be regulated by human law. It's subject to natural laws, so they have nothing to do with it. Black Americans reject this climatic law as nothing more than a poor excuse politicians use to release themselves from the responsibility of prohibiting slavery. So for example, California petitioned for statehood in 1849 and politicians argued that its mountains naturally excluded slavery. So there was no need to regulate it. But Black activists pointed out that this natural exclusion would not actually stop slaveholders from bringing enslaved people to these places. And in fact, white settlers had already begun bringing enslaved laborers with them to California. So white politicians across the US continue to try to toe the line by supposedly leaving slavery up to climate. But Black activists point out that slavery and climate, in fact, have little to do with each other in any natural sense, right? They're like, slavery exists in all latitudes. Cotton grows in other places in the world without slavery. Some places that had once had slavery have since abolished it. Uh, white people cultivate sugar in other places. And so they're like, slaveholders are making a conscious decision to hold enslaved people, right? There's nothing natural about it. But the language of climate and slavery and nature was ubiquitous, right? It even finds its way into Mississippi's statement of secession from the union. And they'd say, quote, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. 
But then after the Civil War, this is like one of my favorite parts, right? You have abolition. And then former slaveholders need to attract laborers so that they can continue to grow crops. And so they cater to white people by claiming that any ideas that white people couldn't labor in the South were in fact totally conjured up by malicious Northerners and they were completely untrue. Like one Houston newspaper called the idea that white people couldn't work in the South, quote, manifestly absurd and demonstrably false. And another in a Georgia paper lamented indignantly the, quote, mistaken ideas and prejudice that white laborers could not work in the South. Another argued that whites could easily cultivate cotton and sugar and tobacco and rice because they're so adaptable. So they say like Northern speakers and newspapers had quote, produced the conviction that the South was no country for white laborers end quote, but actually this is a malicious misrepresentation. And then they return incredibly to the history of Georgia to point to the Salzburgers to say, look, they showed how easily white people could labor in the South, right? So you guys are just, this is terrible. White people should come and work in the South. It's obviously it can happen. I don't know how anyone got the idea that it can't happen. So this is, so all of this kind of unfolds in, in the aftermath of the Civil War. But the long-term legacies of this rhetoric are real. Right By naturalizing theories about climate, labor, and bodies, slaveholders and politicians ended up promoting ideas of biological race. The climatic language was presented as a maxim for too long. The rhetoric about climate and bodies was too difficult to dislodge. And over time, arguments that white people could not labor in hot places and that these places required black laborers became not just an excuse, but an explanation for racial slavery. And the result was a validation and deepening of the idea that black and white bodies were fundamentally different from one another. Because if bodies responded to climates in different ways, there must be some deep biological difference and they create this binary racial formulation. The letters, right, that we saw earlier show clear evidence that physicians, planters, slaveholders, colonial residents, all thought that bodies responded to environmental conditions in the same way and that both got sick. Just they valued some lives more than others. But the language of nature gave white people license to exploit black people's bodies beyond slavery, justifying placing people of color in situations dangerous to their health by leaning on the idea that black bodies were particularly suited to demanding labor in unhealthy places. And ultimately a rhetoric that developed in the 18th century Atlantic for a specific purpose, right? This climatic rhetoric became a shortcut to supporting racist labor practices and environmental racism. Planters in the U S South and the Caribbean deliberately placed black bodies in dangerous environments and specifically sought black laborers for these hazardous spaces. And this sustained and systemic behavior exemplified environmental racism. So if you fell asleep or your mind wandered to what you're going to have for dinner, three brief takeaways. One, we get a really different story if we look at the private sources versus the public sources. Two, this is this, you know, racial slavery is a deep foundation for environmental racism. And three, Planters language defending slavery naturalized bodily difference and made it seem like this natural thing that we would have biological race. I could talk a lot more, but I assume people are done listening to me talk. So thank you. I'm sure we would be happy to have questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, super interesting. I learned a lot. I was totally unaware of this. I have two questions, if I might. One is when you talk about the early uh, kind of presentation of this theory, was there any central moving force, uh, so to speak, like the Fox News of the era that was trying to promote that? And my second question is uh, totally separate. 
Um, you're probably familiar with the photographs that Louis Agassiz had at, at Harvard, um, which of course was, you know, about a hundred years later than some of the things you're talking about. But do you know if his so-called research had anything to do with trying to establish scientifically what you're talking about here? Yeah. So those are great questions. Um, I wouldn't say that there's sort of an agenda for promoting this idea um, in a in a in a Fox News way. Um, I I would say that people who are interested in defending slavery and when slavery becomes threatened, so when it's you know sort of they're they're interested in getting in Georgia, it's threatened in the these debates. That's when this, or it's threatened like in the years leading up to civil war, that's when this rhetoric really comes out in force and they start sort of publishing about it and promoting it. Um, as for like Agassiz, I'm, part of the timing of this is really interesting because you have these debates in Congress and in parliament in the 1780s and 90s. And that is really the time that this rhetoric kind of becomes solidified. And that's the same time that you have the development of sciences like anatomy and biology and, you know, phrenology and craniology that, you know, all of these things develop around that time. And so this, so it seems to me, it's a fairly strong connection between the widely publicized debates about slavery and that, you know, black bodies are different from white bodies and the development of these sciences to study bodily difference. And so my thinking is that this kind of phrenology, craniology type of, 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 uh, you know, scientific inquiry in the mid and late 19th century is a direct outgrowth of these theories about biological bodily difference that are influenced by these debates. So I do see a link there. Was there ever a bonded white labor in Georgia as there was in Virginia? People came over for seven or 10 years, had to pay off their passage. Um, yes, uh, to an extent, right? So people would come over as indentured servants and, um, and then they'd, run away or they would. So people came over as indentured servants in, in kind of different kinds of contracts. And some of them would, you know, be supposed to work for a certain number of years and it would either pay, it would, it would pay for their passage as you're saying. Um, and yet, but these are, those are a lot of the class of servants that the uh, settlers are complaining about that. They're just running away or they're not working or they're, you know, they're being lazy or they're doing all these things. And so they do start with the idea that they're going to have these servants to help out these early colonists. Um, but the servants are looking over at South Carolina and saying, the only people we see who are doing this kind of laborers are slaves. And so there there's, it, it gets even more complicated than sort of early years of Virginia, because you've got this like, racist labor system that's already in place. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for coming. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on existing ideas about the relationship between health and heat and how that might have influenced um, the sort of argument that particular races could labor in heat because, you know, miasma, different kinds of humors, like these are all kinds of discourses and circulation for probably hundreds of years at this point. And the other question is, um, I'm curious to know why the argument that certain racialized bodies could labor in certain climates was more convincing than perhaps economic arguments. Uh, for enslaved labor, because of course, like in the early 18th century, you have the South Sea Company, where lots of wealthy British people have, you know, financial stakes to gain in the slave trade, you know, they're buying shares in the company before there's the bubble and it collapses. So like, why is the argument about climate more convincing to people than the argument um, that this is a kind of economistic way of, of having a division of labor? Yeah, 
Yeah. So those are great questions. Um, for the second question, I, I actually don't think that the climate argument is more convincing. I think that the, the malcontents think it's going to be more convincing because they're like, well, the trustees, they start out with this economic argument and the trustees are like, we don't really care. This isn't about you getting wealthy, right? We're being philanthropists here and funding, you know, look at all of you unemployed, poor white people. Here's a chance for you to do something and make something of yourselves, but you're not supposed to get rich, right? So they start with these economic arguments sort of like, well, we can't possibly do anything. And the trustees are like, we have no interest in you getting rich. So they turn to the climate argument, but the trustees don't really buy that either. Um, but the... It, but when the malcontents kind of go to South Carolina and start publishing all this stuff, they do complain about the economic situation, but they focus also a lot on the climate, just sort of being like, obviously it's impossible, right? Because I think that they sort of think that they're going to get more public sympathy than if they're like, we can't get rich. If they're like, we're dying. Um, so I think that they focus on that because they're looking for sympathy sympathy and they're they're trying to tap into this existing rhetoric but it's not actually that much more successful because the trustees don't buy that either it's more that the 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 colony becomes so depopulated that the trustees are like this is kind of a failing colony and parliament who's sort of allowed the trustees to have this colony and it's like well we need to take this back under our mm -hmm. control and obviously no one's going to live here if they can't have slaves so we'll just allow slavery um the rhetoric and discourse about heat and health. So most of the sort of thinking in sort of Western Europe at this time about health has to do with, um, you know, with, with things like air, like going back to Hippocrates, right? Airs and waters and places and sort of thinking, well, where, which direction is the wind blowing? How strong is that wind? What is your elevation? What is your proximity to water? Are you by standing water? Are you by running water? All of these things about your specific place are going to determine how healthy you are. And so there's a lot of focus on um, microclimates. Like, are you on a hill? Are you down in a swamp? And if you're in a swamp, then you're exposed to miasmas and unhealthy air. And if you're on a hill and you've got some breezes, you're going to be healthy. And so they actually have a pretty nuanced understanding, um, or, you know, thinking about how place affects bodily health. Um, but they don't see it as being any different for black people than they do see it as being for white people, right? They're like, everybody is going to suffer from these conditions. So you have planters thinking about, um, you know, what, well, where, where am I going to situate my house? And then how, and then an increase, especially as there's threats to the slave trade. And they're like, well, we might not be able to import people forever. Like, where is the, what is the situation of enslaved people's houses? And so you see this kind of thing in the private letters. Um, but the heat thing is a, is a holdover from, like Aristotle, right? Who is like, it's impossible to live in these hot places. And then it's sort of like, well, it's not impossible for anyone to live in these hot places, it turns out, because it, there's people there. And it's not impossible for anything to grow in these hot places, because it turns out, actually, there's a lot of stuff growing in these places. But, you know, we're not sure if, you know, if white people can live in these hot places, maybe we're, you know, they're, they're like, maybe we're not destined to be there. So, so there's like a, this, this holdover from Aristotle, but actually there's a pretty nuanced understanding about place and health, if that makes sense. Hello. Um, I was wondering how did they, you know, who are the trustees? You must be English, right? Yes. And um, since slavery was held in violence, you know, so it's like, why didn't they say, well, they're running away. Um, they're still dying. And we're building houses north and south, east and west. So and the climate is all over. So what about the scientists that were thinking that? And like I said, the death of, uh, of the slaves that were going through all of that. I mean, did they not count how many slaves died during the harsh conditions? Well, right. That's like, that's like exactly the point, right? Is it, is that's like, you're exactly right. It's like, you know, you, you get all these, uh, 
uh, yeah, well, okay. So it sometimes drives me crazy because, um, you'll have even my, you have these arguments, right. That they're like, uh, that, that planners are making white people can't work in these climates because look at how many of them are dying. And you have more modern historians like into the 20th century and stuff saying, oh, it must be that there were differences that they observed and that, you know, but the truth of the matter is many more black people were dying, right? And there, and and actually the, the records show this. If you look at the ledgers, right? There's like this many people died this year. It's, it's hugely dangerous and, and difficult work and violent, right? And so, uh, it's, it's almost amazing that this myth develops because you have huge numbers of black people dying under slavery. And yet you get when, and, and actually the planters are asked this, they're like, well, why by, by parliament, right? They're like, why, what do you make of all the black people dying? Like the, you know, enslaved people dying on your plantations. And, and they're like, oh, it's their own fault. They're they're going out at night, and the night air is dangerous to health. They're 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 dancing too much, and this is dangerous to their health. They they have you know that so they they find so many ways to blame this on the enslaved people that they're like, oh no, it's really we're we're trying to be such good slaveholders, but it, we just can't help it, right? They're all there, so they they turn the blame onto the enslaved people themselves. But what's so incredible to me is that historians kind of took them at their word and they were like, oh, it must be that there were differences. And the only difference is that more black people were dying than white people. Like that. So yeah, it's totally crazy. Um, good, good point. <laughs> uh, Katie, thanks yeah. very much for this. Uh, this is a, a book that I've been looking forward to for quite some time and to have an opportunity to read it shortly would be great. Um, We've been talking about slavery as a, a single kind of system to this point, but as I know you're aware, uh, there were lots of different crops and lots of different ways to, to uh, take advantage of enslaved people. Uh, we think on the one hand of tobacco and sugar uh, as main crops, but in South Carolina, there were people growing rice, uh, there was indigo, uh, coffee in Jamaica. And I'm wondering, are the arguments for using enslaved labor for all of these different crops the same, or is there any variety to? That's a great question. Um, the main, they, it mostly comes up in reference to sugar and rice. Um, so it's mostly in terms of, well, in the Caribbean, uh, black laborers are needed because the work of sugar cultivation is really difficult and laborious, but you actually have in these debates, um, uh, I, I, I don't have these quotes memorized, but you have people saying things like, oh, the work is so easy actually, that just, you know, one stroke and all the sugar cane just comes down. It's incredibly easy to do. So they're saying both things. They're like, this is so hard that white people can't do it. And it's so easy that basically enslaved people don't even have to work hard at all. Um, and so that's, they really focus on the sugar in, in the parliamentary arguments. And then in, um, it, with the rice, you know, there's sort of this thing of like, well, maybe white people can grow some crops, but there's no way they can grow rice because that's really difficult and dangerous labor. And then you have travelers going through and writing about like, yeah, all the people who are working in and around the rice fields are getting sick and they're dying black, white, anybody who's around there. Right. And, and so you have this sense of actually labor in rice plantations and rice fields is, is difficult and dangerous labor. And so white people are going to avoid it as much as they can. Um, but, you know, I don't, I, they, the, as sort of dominant crops like sugar and rice, these become the ones that, are, that get involved in these debates more than a lot of the other crops that are, um, that are obviously being grown by enslaved laborers. They just, you know, a coffee planter who wants to keep enslaved laborers is unlikely to sort of say, well, actually the labor is, is, is kind of different. It's not as bad as sugar labor right on my plantation. So they're sort of, they're, they're, they're willing to be subsumed under sugar and rice when the, when the arguments are about growing these uh, crops that are dangerous and unhealthy 
So we have a, a couple of questions about clarification. Um, uh, one of our visitors said, um, could you define what low country means? And uh, that you said uh, some of the wells were poisoned. How and why did that happen? And what were they poisoned with? And then we have some questions from our online audience. Okay. Um, yes. So sorry, I should have defined low country. So low country is sort of this region of South Carolina and Georgia um, that's fairly coastal. Um, so it's low country because it's actually lower elevation. And a lot of it is uh, for, um, uh, like in Carolina, a lot of there's uh, uh, tidal rice plantations. So they're tidal rivers. So, you know, when the tide comes in, the rivers kind of get pushed up and they flood uh, like low lying areas and create country area for rice growing. Um, so that kind of region of South Carolina, Georgia, that's fairly coastal and prone to tidewater flooding is like low country region. Um, the Spanish, you know, and I don't know too much about, I, I don't know, I do not know what the wells were poisoned with. Um, I have just read accounts that sort of say, oh, these, they, the Spanish have poisoned the wells. And the reason that they're, was that part of the question is why they're poisoning them? Okay. The reason that they're poisoning them is because they don't want the English to take control of the island. And so part of their tactic for sort of fighting off the English is trying to poison well so that the English die and don't take control of the island. Um, I don't know what they used as poison. Uh, in the past, I know that, I mean, I, I had, never mind. I'm going to hesitate to say because I might, I might just be making it up. So never mind. <laughs> so we have a few questions online. Um, someone asks, where does malaria, which was not well understood in the 17th and 18th century, fit into the argument that African laborers were better suited to the American coastal South? Uh, yeah. So, uh, the first part of that question is really a big part of the answer, which is that it was not well understood. Right. And so no one actually had a name for malaria in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, you know, people, they wrote about things like tertiary fever, like sort of recurring fever that modern historians have said, well, this probably describes malaria, but I think there are a number of problems with that. Right. First of all, it's really kind of a dangerous thing to diagnose the past um, based on a couple of letters. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of different things were just called fevers. Um, and, and the main point, well, there's, okay, I've got a couple other points, but okay, the main point of this, and if somebody wants to talk about it more, I can, I can be more explicit, um, but no one is writing about this, right? No one's saying, oh, you know, I mean, right. So modern people will say, oh, well, you know, current estimates are something like maybe one in 14 African-Americans has sickle cell anemia, which pretends, prevents, protects them from malaria. But we have no way of knowing what the proportion of malarial resistance was several hundred years ago. And even if we're going to say, for the sake of argument, it's the same, that means 13 out of 14 people are getting really sick and dying or, you know, getting really sick. So it's not as though you're going to look at a group of 14 people and say, oh, one person seems healthy. They must all be so healthy, right? When 13 of them are sick and dying. And, and no one at the time is writing this way, right? I kept looking for that in our archives, like looking in the letters, oh, there must be a difference. But instead, it's all about where you are, what the look is it rainy you're probably sick have you been outside in the wet weather that's going to get you sick and so there no one at the time is thinking this way and so i think for us to kind of look back and say oh there must be a reason ignores that the the fact that the reason was racism right that it, that we're like trying to justify planters keeping enslaved africans by like finding excuses for them but really like they, if they, if they had wanted that to be their excuse, they would have written it down. So I can go into that more, but. Okay. And our last question is, did these arguments persist after emancipation, despite the need to debunk them to recruit white workers? And was this argument repeated in history books, looking back on and justifying slavery? 
Yes. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the first part of that question again? Yes. So uh, did these arguments persist after emancipation, despite the need to debunk them for white workers? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, they definitely did. Um, And so they come up again and again in different contexts. Um, They come up even, uh, and this, this whole argument about climate and race and labor comes up a lot. Um, it, the Panama Canal, if you look at, you know, there's arguments about who is fit to dig and work in these conditions for the Panama Canal and who is not, and that enters into ideas about race. And uh, basically, racist labor practices, environmental racism, and, and putting, and the idea that, you know, oh, Black bodies are suited to these climates better and white people are suited to these climates. It's totally, I could, go, I could go on a lot, but I know we're at seven. So yes, they persisted. And yes, historians continued to sort of justify them. Um, in the first decades of the 20th century, there's a couple of books explicitly saying this is why there was racial slavery. And even now you see it as like a throwaway line here or there, like, oh, this is why there was African slavery in the Americas um, without really going into it at all. And so that's, yes, it persists. Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Johnson for our presentation. And we have books for sale in the lobby. And for those of us joining online, I hope you will uh, visit your uh, favorite online retailer and buy a copy of the book. Thank you.